Greetings and good afternoon, everyone. It is so good to see you all here with us today. Um, before I jump in to um, say a few words, um, I want to let you all know that this event is being recorded. With that said, I want to welcome you all to John Jay College's inaugural Live from the Ninth Floor Symposium. Today's event is one of three events that we'll be hosting this spring on the theme Black Lives and Reparative Justice. I'm Kimberly McKinson and I'm an assistant professor in anthropology here at John Jay and along with Professor Shreya Subramani and uh, from political science and Professor Teresa Booker from Africana Studies, I am one of the organizers of this year's Live from the Ninth Floor Symposium. Now, we've received generous support from John Jay's Office for the Advancement of Research from the Office of Undergraduate Studies and the Student Council, as well as the Departments of Africana Studies, Anthropology and Political Science. And our event today would not be possible without the amazing support from anthropologist Professor Barbara Cassidy, who has helped our organizational and planning efforts in tremendous ways. So I just want to start by saying gratitude to everyone who not only got the vision for Life from the Ninth Floor, Black Lives and Reparative Justice, but also who mobilized brain power and good old fashioned elbow grease in order to bring this vision to life. Now, driving the life from the ninth floor Black Lives and Reparative Justice Symposium is the goal to bring to John Jay leading interdisciplinary scholars and to put them in conversation with our faculty and students in order to facilitate discussion and deep around a central theme the precarity of Black life and the radical possibilities for reparative justice in America. Moreover, as you participate in today's event, and I hope that you'll be able to make the upcoming talks in March and in May, but I want you today to be audacious enough to imagine John Jay as having the potential to lead the country in the thinking and the efforts around reparative justice. Um, you know, in no uncertain terms, the brutal killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd serve as the backdrop for this year's Live from the Ninth Floor Symposium. As I'm sure many of you know, today marks the two-year anniversary of the killing of Ahmaud Arbery, and just yesterday, his three killers were found guilty on all counts in a federal hate crime trial. So as we all individually and collectively continue to reflect on the lives and the deaths of Arbery, Taylor and Floyd, I hope that live from the ninth floor will push us to think more deeply on processes of racialization, black life, black death, transformative justice, as well as the limits and possibilities of repair. I hope that this symposium will compel us to interrogate the historical making of blackness and what a true liberatory politics can look like in our time. I hope that we will leave here today moved to deeply consider counter hegemonic articulations of democracy that will allow for new imaginings of black diasporic life in the Americas. Now, let me introduce to you our esteemed speaker today. Dr. Christopher Harris is an assistant professor of global and international studies at the University of California, Irvine. He received his PhD in politics and historical research from the New School for Social Research here in New York. Prior to starting at UC Irvine, Dr. Harris was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of African American Studies at Northwestern University. And Dr. Harris's work sits at the intersection of Black political thought, Black culture, Black aesthetics, and Black social movements. And we can all look out for Dr. Harris's first book, which is on the horizon, to build a Black future, Blackness, and social movement in the time of Black Lives Matter. And this book is going to be published this fall by P Princeton University Press. Moderating the conversation with Dr. Harris this afternoon will be our very own Dr. Shreya Subramani. Dr. Subramani is an assistant professor in the law and society major within the political science department here at John Jay College. She specializes in legal and political anthropology and black studies with a focus on the relations between racial inequality, carceral geographies, labor and city life. And her current book project is an ethnography of emergent re-entry programming for formerly incarcerated people in New Orleans. So 
As Dr. Subramani engages Dr. Harris in conversation following his presentation, I want you all to feel free to post your questions in the chat um, or to use the raise hand function, you know, whichever you're more comfortable with. I especially want to encourage your students, and I'm so happy to see so many students on this call today. I want to encourage you to not be shy about posing your questions to Dr. Harris, really, you know, relish this opportunity to um, engage uh, a critical thinker and a critical scholar. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Harris. Let's show him some Zoom love. Well, first, uh, it's an honor to be a part of the series and uh, I'm really grateful for, for the invitation. Uh, to, to present this work and uh, to be in conversation with, with all of you. Um, I'll pause for a second and, and just uh, set up the work before I get into it. It was actually co-authored, it's not, not a piece that I wrote by myself, uh, with, with a really close friend of mine, um, a family even, uh, Dr. Marissa Solomon at, at Barnard College um, in New York. Uh, and it is divided into four parts, which I'll narrate as I move, but just so you have a sense of, of, of how, how the operations of the piece itself. Um, one second, let me just get this up. Okay, so the, the, uh, the piece that I'm going to, to read for you is called Black Grammar, Repertoires of Abolition's, uh, Abolition's Future, Present, and Past. Enclosures. COVID-19 caused a moment of global captivity. Differentially ensnared under stay-at-home orders, the pandemic proved uneven in its impact. Higher infection and fatality rates laid seeds to Black communities across the U.S., indexing, once again, the precarity of Black life and our proximity to premature death. Now, just as Blackness preceded those unnamed Black bodies disproportionately, disproportionately lost to the virus, it likewise preceded Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, whose murders were shadowed in similarly horrific fashion by the minutes long refrain of George Floyd's dying pleas. While forced to shelter in place, the mathematics of anti-Blackness, the numbers, narratives, tolls, and ledgers marked 2020 as a future archive in the making, a counting of the dead in repetition that quote, provides the conditions through which Black history will be told and studied, end quote. In opposition to the racialized violence of enclosures, the socio-spatial patterns and regimes of knowledge that structure our lives, precipitate and tally our deaths. We sought strategies to think and write about Black livingness, ways to affirm the resistance in and of Black life. So it was not by chance we found ourselves immersed in CLR James's account of the San Domingo Revolution and the Black Jacobins just days before the Black-led uprisings began. The 12 year long rebellion that created Haiti contested the institutions of thought, governance and exploitation that undergirded the white supremacy of colonialism and enslavement. James's radical priority of the colony made black struggle central as opposed to peripheral to European history and his own historical present. By writing an account of revolution for revolution, he pointed to a decolonial anti-capitalist future that had not yet happened a heretofore Black future. Now to read the Black Jacobins is to be reminded that the legacies of anti-Blackness that kill us in our homes and on our neighborhood streets, legacies that make brutal the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic for our communities is also a legacy of the insurgent desire to move while confined. Moving, thinking, and riding towards liberation demands holding on to its tents. What would have to have happened itself a kind of blackened knowledge of not only the present political and social constellation, but the ruptures that produced it. Just as many black radicals encountered, developed and pronounced revolutionary thought while held captive, we too met the black Jacobins while enclosed. Freedom fighters who continue to revolt and who we have already met many times over. Theirs is the spirit of world making incumbent to the black radical tradition or what we're calling black grammar. Black grammar is an inherited repertoire of rebellion prescriptive of a future yet to come. It brings into focus the shape, scope, 
and historical antecedents of last year's uprisings as examples of Black livingness, something we do and learn by doing, a way to apprehend the demand to defund the police in the same breath as the battle for San Domingo. While this repertoire is a long-standing mode of survival, it is also a call, an index, a vision that insists not on the reform of our current world, but rather the end of it. Building on and channeled through a shared heritage, we see Black grammar as synonymous with the praxis of abolition, quote, a dream towards futurity vested in insurgent counter-civilizational histories, genealogies of collective genius that perform liberation under conditions of duress, end quote. In other words, Black grammar is and has always been a fugitive response to the enclosures erected for property and profit, enclosures to which Black bodies are relegated, but also critique, disfigure, and dismantle with Black joy. While grammar names the structure of rules that outline the parameters of a language, it also details the study of what language enables, how it is used, what it performs, and it's multimodal plying of space to speak out something else. This presentation is a meditation on the tools of rebellion, those illegible to the master, for we know his tools will not dismantle the house from which he accrues his benefits. Amid ongoing Black struggle, we draw attention to, to how Black grammar, as practiced and performed during the uprisings, prefigures liberation, toppling monuments, burning buildings, singing, shouting, dancing where we're not supposed to be. The freedom dreams exploding again onto our streets, that quote of our ancestors, those who walk before us and walk beside us and those yet to come, end quote. So we elevate these tools, defacement and revival, forged through captivity, enabling us to speak, demand and conjure the end of white supremacy. Our intention is to make room for these acts, to allow them to teach us about the now, what has always been, and a predicate future in which the mattering of Black life is the horizon. Fashioned in what Christina Sharp has termed the total climate of anti-Blackness, this grammar is not bound by words. Instead, it opens on to the numerous refusals that Black people spontaneously use and collectively share in the face of the current order of things, of racial capitalism, heteronormativity, and the liberal state of a world incapable of care and concern for all Black life. Black grammar names how we use tools, not a complete range of what those tools are. It outlines the terrain of their deployment when an open rebellion against white fence, the everyday language of law and order, civility, reform, and progress that shield the racial violence necessary to maintain white sovereignty. Defacement. The protests that erupted in the aftermath of George Floyd's state-sanctioned murder left tremors around the world. With them, images of broken windows and burned out buildings circulated. One such image of a Nike store in the Bronx came coupled with the caption, fire set, windows smash, stores looted, NYC day four. By captioning, capturing black protests as looting, political pundits recuperate violent police repression as peacekeeping and a necessary response to restore order. These captions are instructions for how white sovereignty authorizes specific readings of black movement. They are a ledger, the calculus of property superordinate to black life. In other words, they make white sense of black destruction. They teach us how property is a public pedagogy under racial capitalism, requiring police violence to uphold. While the racial terror of policing authenticates this reading, it also obscures how black destruction critiques sovereignty's calculus and the racializing project of, pr of protecting property by subverting white sense. Now, under slavery, whiteness consolidated itself around the economic logic of legal personhood that definitionally enshrined enslaved persons as things to be possessed. During Reconstruction, the legal protections afforded to white landowners re-enslaved Black persons as convicts, ensuring Black people were not only criminal, but property of the state. In the wake of the Great Depression, the enduring Black poverty cleaved by the New Deal's redlining would further yield Black dispossession to Black criminalization. And this tethering expanded the modes through which the state 
private prisons and other businesses, i.e. the prison industrial complex profit off of the black body shifting states of captivity. These examples demonstrate that property is required to bring white ownership into being and that control over the black body is central to ensuring its teaching. Amidst political unrest, meditation on the ethics of looting remind us how central protecting property is to protecting whiteness. Black protest is thus a threat to the common sense order of white domination and its violent quotidian erasures. For non-white bodies subject to the mandates of property, statues of slave traders and conquistadors, police precincts and the steps of city hall materialize inscriptions that naturalize oppression into the public domain. Destruction then is not just an irrational act or a result of mob mentality. Toppling monuments to enslavers and the colonizers is a way of challenging the reigning economy of speech about whose history matters. As nascent political communication, tagging and bloodying statues of Christopher Columbus is a form of rewriting that forces us to reread the role of conquistador humans and other genocidal figures. As a form of writing, defacing the pedagogy of property upends the grammars of whiteness. Black life and death are not just punctuation marks within liberal inscriptions, inclusions, or progressive white futures. Black writing and its grammars seek to tear at the seams of a world written with sentences that foreclose endings and Black beginnings. Thinking from the formative and inherited enclosures of white sense, white property, white order, white pre preservationist, white grammar, asks us to attune our reading to the tenses of living as if, or the politics of prefiguration that involves living the future now. Black protest attacks and thus critiques regimes of property central to white supremacy's material formations, territory, and monuments. By defacing the whiteness of public po uh, pedagogy, not only do these acts refuse the conditions and presumed authority of how we speak the world into being, they challenge the reigning economies of appropriate speech and the latent expectation of how change is supposed to come. The burning of the US embassy in Athens, Greece, the sinking of, of 17th century slave trader Edward Colston into the river Avon in Bristol, and the toppled, toppled statue of George Washington tagged and wrapped in a burning US flag in Portland, Oregon, are all prescriptive speech acts for abolition. On the global scale, these acts situate the abolition of police alongside a critique of imperialism and the injuries of racial capitalism. As techniques of defacement, Black grammar reframes looting as collective declarations about the presence of the past and the agentive annihilation required to bring a different future into being. This structure of speaking violates the rules of civilized grammar, the appropriate way to ask for change and the forms and kinds of volition for that which will have to have happened. It's located in the tradition of what Hortense Pillars calls the creation of sentences that could not be anticipated, that violated the rules within the site of grammar. Revival. So if defacement is an act swung in service to an alternative future, so are the moving hips, gestures, and chants of Black-led movement building that resounded through the streets. Singing and dancing, the euphoric fashions of revival reflect techniques of the body that serve as co-conspirators to anger, rage, and the necessity of destruction. So along with defacement, we understand revival to be part of Black grammar's habit memory, the knowledge of being a body of a certain kind, a Black body once bought and sold, wherein the past is not pictured as such, but sedimented and structural. An ancestral tradition, Cultivated in cotton fields and slave cabins, the alchemy of Black protest transforms music and dance into a promise of freedom. It recasts Black joy as an experiment with liberation. These ecstatic rituals of sound and motion or the insistence on moving signify a world outside the corporal protocols of white tents. They conjure stories brimming with fugitive knowledge archived in the reservoir of Black social life that route a radically reimagined politics and sociality. As a counter narrative to those sanctioned by the state, tales of the quote, multifaceted artifact of black communal resistance and defiance defy a political order premised on black dispossession 
subjugation, and death. Their shape and character herald the minor key sensibilities and ethical commitments that will enable the world we build in and on the ruins of this one. In other words, we see the joy evident in the uprisings, the variety and spontaneity of its forms as a roadmap, as a roadmap and prelude authored by the ungovernable. It prefigures what is yet to come, just as it announces what has always been here. Videos demonstrating the range of performances during the protests bear witness to this duality. They testify to the insurgent genealogies of Black life and culture, revivals of power and possibility. So at a march in Chicago, the bombastic blare of trombones led a second line of knee-high steps and shouts, recalling the participatory parade custom that has long been a space for the articulation of local subjectivities in Black New Orleans neighborhoods. During a rally in front of City Hall, revelers in Atlanta bopped to a hip hop beat based on a black woman's defiant taunt, you about to lose your job. In doing so, they reinscribed the sonic texture of oppositional speech that links hip hop to the blues and elevates the defiant character of black idioms and expression. Summoning black celebration spirit, protesters from Brooklyn to Los Angeles refashioned the city landscape into a backyard cookout by doing the electric slide and other line dances popular within the black intramural. While exploding here and now, the refusal enacted through these willful embraces of joy are nonetheless acts of remembrance. To take a vivid example, a young girl in Puerto Rico moved to the percussive spontaneity of the bamba, a drum back shake rooted in slavery into a bevy of onlookers. Like the other moments of revival, her performance registers how black communicative motion and form is inherited, a call and response that exceeds temporality. Unbounded, embodied, and diasporic, the choreographies of resistance within and across the uprisings announce the past, present, and future tense of Black grammar. They demonstrate that abolition names a praxis, a long stage striving, as much as it outlines parameters for the unseen against white sense. All, pro all Black protest is a protest of Black death, whether it's the demands of brief on the police or the hidden transcripts used to communicate in the slave quarters of San Domingo, these repertoires of expressive action are political speech that carries forth the cause of another world. Marginalized people's communication under a violent hegemonic order is often illegible, what has elsewhere been termed infrapolitics. Expressive action, especially those deeply embedded in Black political and cultural practice, are not immediately understood as political precisely because they rest outside the sense-making terms of white sovereignty. White sovereignty accrues through the repetition of racial violence. It not only demands that blackness is a problem of law and order, but that the protection of property is pedagogically central to the preservation of citizenship and democracy. Black grammar rejects the baseness of this logic, insisting instead that a black future is not yet here. Moving while captive is an inherited form of subversion that conveys the future we want to come. Chanting, dancing, singing, and shouting demonstrate laterally amongst ourselves a knowledge of what is possible. Black joy then is a practice and method of refusing the repetition of black death, the numbers and narratives that mark the mathematics of anti-blackness and fill the archives of the diaspora. It is a way to honor the dead and dying to avenge the suffering of our ancestors while revi with revivals that celebrate Black life. Doing so openly in the streets while flanked by police and riot gear defies the sanctity of the state and its actions in the name of safety. It is a performance that prefigures their demise. In that sense, if infrapolitics creates deviant communion under a white police state, then the black grammar of abolition is also a politics of prefiguration that allows us to write, read, and live out the future now. Towards this end, disfiguring private or state-owned property clears a path for rewriting space, how we mark time, and whose history matters. White sense assumes that the current order of things is capable of promoting our livelihood. This logic also presumes black struggle can act as a corrective to white sovereignty and that its violent enforcement needs just a bit of adjusting. 
but our blood, our labor, our sacrifice has taught us that the normalized and accepted language of reform, civility, and progress, the ease with which people call for law and order, shields the terror necessary to maintain white sovereignty in an anti-Black world. Black grammar allows us to hear Black people's demands for something else. Abolition, not just here in this country, but globally. So as they were in 1804, the, the, the Black Jacobins are on our streets right now. It was the people, James teaches us, tearing at the seams of white scent. They burned San Domingo flat, so at the end of the war, it was a charred desert. They rewrote history, and in doing so, rewrote, rewrote the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris, uh, for that just in incredible, um, well, the incredible reading, but also the incredible kind of engagement with Black rebellion. And I think a lot of times in our classes, we spend a lot of energy talking about the ways that um, we understand structural racism and and colonialism, um, but it's also important that our students and our colleagues also, you know, engage uh, how we think about rebellion, how we think about revolution, activism, resistance, and how that takes on so many scales and forms and times and spaces. And so I think that um, I'm going to try uh, to sort of convey some initial thoughts, ask a few questions, then uh, you can answer those questions. And while Dr. Harris is answering those questions, I would love for people to start raising their hands so we can call on the audience to ask questions uh, too. Uh, you can also write questions in the chat if that's what you're more comfortable with. Um, so normative understandings of grammar and even critical understandings of grammar like Horton Spiller's Spillers' well-known discussion of the racializing and gender form of American grammar would allude to a structure of confinement, a fundamental type, and thus specific and delimited relations to, uh, to law-like power. Yet Black grammar is challenging this notion to offer an ever-present resistance that is perhaps illegible to the other grammars we know, um, Black grammar frames this illegibility to dominant structures as constitutive, as, as necessary to liberation movements. And to remain illegible, its form is not fixed. It keeps moving, changing, being fugitive and evading capture and co-optation. So in using your words, um, I resist to call black grammar an analytic. I think that's too simplistic. So I'm gonna use your words. It's a desire to move while confined, a history that centralizes Black liberation struggle, an imagining of decolonial and anti-capitalist futures, a spirit of world-making incumbent to the Black radical tradition, an inherited repertoire of rebellion, a praxis of abolition. So it's all of these things simultaneously. And, and specifically in this, in this uh, presentation today, Black grammar names a dual presence inherent to rebellion, that of defacement that could take the form of toppling monuments and burning buildings, an attack on regimes of property and the state sanctioned violence that protect property, as well as that of revival, perhaps in the form of singing and dancing where you are not supposed to, the joy of movement building. And in centering this dual presence, you intend to, quote, make room for these acts and allow them to teach us about the now, about what has always been, and about a predicate form in which the mattering of Black life is the horizon. Black grammar as a way of thinking and being in the present relies on a conscious situatedness within the histories of liberation struggles. Like in your presentation, you evoke the Haitian Revolution as central to you even developing this work. You moreover articulate the politics of the present as an orientation to the past through a unique subjunctive tense, what would have had to have happened. 
in order to make a different future. I'm hoping you can explain a bit on the way you discuss these temporalities of rebellion. What from the past do we critically draw upon to create social solidarities and radical movements now? How do you see Black grammar as a form of intervening upon the way we understand and reckon with history? The history is told, the history is untold, and the material conditions, um, the historical conditions that may, uh, sorry, the historical, um, uh, the material <laughs> conditions that, that we live in today. And a follow up to that within a more geographic context is could you discuss a bit about how this praxis of Black grammar works to bring histories of global anti uh, colonial and anti capitalist struggles into relation? Um, and, and so I have a couple more, but I can wait and answer and then I'll respond. Uh, oh, yeah, maybe we could uh, go go back and go back and forth if, if, totally. that, if that works. Um, you know, it's funny when 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 uh, Marissa and I, Dr. Solomon and I were were coming to this uh, piece uh, and, and thinking about grammar uh, as 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 representing, a, you know, a sort of recognition of, of familiarity, you know, like this, through certain modes of rebellion. Um, it, I think what we wanted to, what what we were observing while reading the Black Jacobins and seeing the uh, the uprising is, you know, kind of a consistency in form that is important to allow us to see that these struggles have been continuous and that the modes of, of, of rebellion, um, the tools that we use have been consistent and that drawing the present to the past kind of invokes what is necessary for the future. That that and that necessity isn't necessarily uh, you know uh, the burning of a building per se, but the rejection of the structural status quo as impossible for our survival. And you know, so so by the black radical tradition always has a way of tending to itself. Black thinkers make references to previous black movements. For us, taking that from you know, a predicate formation in the black radical tradition and putting it out there for other people to hold. We hope not just connects these methods to these movements and to blackness as such, but then becomes a toolkit for our own struggle um, that pushes us towards the past four lessons. Most all, all of the quote unquote successful revolutions studied prior revolutions. Right, you know, the um, the uh, Ruff, Russian Revolution studied the French Revolution, Chinese Revolution, studied it, and so on. Right, there there's a revolutionary lineage and toolkit and playbook that we build upon, not necessarily adopt full scale, depending on our own, own historical presence and the conditions under which we live. Uh, so, black grammar for us uh, is is a, a gesture towards that toolkit. Um, both in terms of what is necessary, but also letting us understand that 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 these struggles have been persistent over time, pressed against a structure that has similarly been persistent over time. I hope that gets to 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 part the first part of the question, and then the second part is just to say once we recognize this through Black grammar and its geographical um, expanse. We again realize that it's not just about Black people's struggles, but but marginalized people struggle all over the world. Um, that 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 these methods tend to be what we have, all we have, in order to in order to speak our desire for something else. And so, in the same breath that we think about Black struggle, we must necessarily think about uh, you know Palestinian struggle or uh, you know struggle in, in 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 different parts of the world as being synonymous, not in terms of the grievance, the historical grievance or the, the you know, impacts on you know, people's, the particularities of, particular, of people's lives, but synonymous in what it demands, the end of the world and the creation of something else for all of us. I hope, I hope that, that gets up. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there is a, uh, 
a sort of when when I read this piece and then when you spoke the piece, it it uh, definitely kind of we have a visual, right? We have the global Black Lives Matter movement. We see it, um, and I also recognize how that movement is drawn upon across the globe and is rearticulated in different contexts with very different histories. Um, and I even think about, you know, in, in, in South Asia, the anti-caste movement draws heavily on the black radical tradition to sort of think about Dalit led movements. So it is very um, sort of, uh, you know, your, your response was, was really um, kind of wonderful. Uh, the, it leads to this next question about abolition being global. Um, and I think oftentimes, well, one at John Jay, but also kind of more broadly, um, we hear a lot about abolition primarily in the context of the abolition of policing or the abolition of prison in the US. Um, when you speak of an abolition's future, what is abolished? Uh, to, I mean, to, to be frank, everything. But that shouldn't be that shouldn't be as uh, uh, you know scary to us. That should be exciting. That should be an opening up of creativity and and possibility. It is true that oftentimes, um, because the you know most recent iteration of the abolitionist movement was a, a kind of direct response to the prison industrial complex, um, it it too points to the, the connectivity between that prison industrial complex and larger structural structures you know within the United States but also globally and so you know the example of the Haitian Revolution is is is, is great in terms of situating the emergence of a particular world order right abolition is against that world order and all of the uh, abolition as, as we're defining it is against the institutions of that world order which includes the police but it also in, includes modes of governance. You know, um, my, my next project is called The Last President. And the reason why it's called The Last President is, is because I'm aiming to, to expand this abolitionist vision to understand that what we're looking to tackle is the modern world system as such. Discrete institutions within that world system need to be tackled one by one. And there's motion, uh, notions of strategy and tactics that, you know, principally force us to concentrate our attention in one direction or the other, but the goal, the goal has to remain the end of the modern world system and replacing that modern world, some world system with, with modes of community and being with and for each other that actually meet the material needs of people across the globe. And so we can't be small-minded about this, either in terms of where we're directing our attention for destruction and creativity, um, but also to be precious about the things that we've inherited, the institutions and ways of being that we've inherited, that we've come to be comfortable in and with, and that we take, in, we take as normal and correct. No, they can't be normal and correct or understood to be normal and correct if the maintenance of these institutions or these ways of living constantly produces violence and subjugation for black other, minds, other, uh, other and other marginalized communities for whole regions of the world in subservience to the quote unquote global north. All of this needs to, to, to we, we need to embody this as, a, as, a, as, a, as an ethic, you know, um, not being unrealistic about living uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but as a, as a pursuit of an otherwise as a future tense proposition that, that we enact in the here and now in any way that we can from wherever we are. Absolutely. And, and in saying that, you know, what does Black grammar then call upon us as students, scholars, and educators to do? I think, That's a hard yeah, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, uh, so, let me let me respond in this way. I would say, and I think uh, Marissa and Dr. Solomon would would agree that there are two audiences here. We are we are speaking to directly to Black people about our inheritance and our heritage and how to read it and how to understand it. Um, 
and that inheritance is shared with other marginalized communities who, who have lived forever and ever in struggle. And so on the one hand, it's a recognition of this. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, call to claim it, right? And to move accordingly. More broadly, it's a, it's a, it's a way to tackle the imperatives of what we call white sense. And we don't mean white sense to be pejorative to white people. We're, we're talking about a particular logic and a way of moving that emerges through the creation of the modern world system. The one that says that what we ought to do is reform this or that, or changes within the margins will fix the situation. What I think uh, Black grammar is calling on all people to do is to reject white sense, to reject the idea that you know, changes around the edges will be enough. And then to operate from wherever you are, where, you know, we're in a particularly privileged space, to be honest, in the university, I get that, right? You know, so, you know, what does it mean to reject white sense in the context of the university? What does it mean to recognize through black grammar that, 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 the, that we need to tear down in order to build up? What does that look like in, you know, in the classroom? Again, it's not a push towards, you know, recognizing reality or how we're actually living the actually existing world. But there are all kinds of things that we can do if we one hand recognize through this dialectic between black grammar and white sense that, that, that something uh, uh, r radically destructive and creative is necessary in order to move us closer to the possibility of another world. And I think that's a task that if taken on as, as I suggested before, kind of as an ethics, as a mode of moving and being, abolition as practice, as Dylan Rodriguez likes to say, right? it's something that you do, it's not an end, right? I think that's, some, that, that, that's an imperative that we all can and should take on in Black grammar is, is, is simultaneously making that invitation to all in a general sense and, and to Black and other marginalized people in particular to, to claim as something that, that is um, in us to do. Thank you so much. Um, I, I do wanna make sure we get plenty of, of audience questions too. Um, I know there was an audience member, Abu, who had his hand up first or their hand up. And then uh, Teresa, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Booker. Um, also had a hand up. Um, I think Abu has his hand down. Abu, do you okay. want to speak? Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harris, for uh, for coming and attending. You're you're part of you're one of my guests as well, and I I, I just want to thank you. So I'm gonna play the devil's advocate only because I'm not sure if I understand the argument, and and I know the devil does not need an advocate. So I, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, and I just want to preface it by saying thank you for coming. I just want to make sure I understand. So from what I understand from your paper is you're saying that it may be necessary uh, to be radical. By, by being violent. And that is the nature of black speech, a type of black speech. Um, and I just wanna make sure I got that before I continue. Is that right? Is, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I guess the short of it is, is uh, uh, to build off of, uh, in some ways from a thinker like Franz Fanon. Um, um, who makes the argument in Wretched of the Earth that it is impossible to undo the socio-political uh, structures that we live under, whether it's materially or psychologically, without some form of violence. And so I, so I, yeah, I would argue that 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 violence, in whatever register you name it is a part of a black grammar and that whether it's materially or psychologically some kind of violence some kind of undoing or undoing involves a form of violence that we should embrace and accept okay because it seems to be when you i don't am i talking about what somebody's let me just get this point so it so i hear what you're saying 
I, I hear what you're saying. There's a range of violence. Violence can be just undoing, but then there's a range of violence, which can be that stuff that we saw on January, the whatever, the 6th or the 9th, whatever that crazy day was. And it just mm -hmm. seems to me, the title of your paper is Black Grammar. When I think about what is traditionally referred to as Black Grammar is AAVE, right? It's Ebonics. Mm -hmm. And so there's this term in which we see society says, this is wrong. This is not acceptable. This makes you the other. This makes you an outlier. And it seems to me that if you take this, 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 this premise and you say that Black, that the Black Grammar is necessary, national black grammar that violence is necessary to achieve this end it must be radical it must be violent it must be like all these other uh abolitionist type movements that have have, have made this radical change it seems like you you may be ignoring unless you, you're not and i misread this the other type of a radicalness it was radical when 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 um the civil rights the kids during the civil rights era decided to go and sit at a counter and get spit on right it was radical for people to walk someplace and have dogs you know bite them anyway that was radical too peaceful yet radical something that was that was uh, deemed as 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 very very unique but yet it got the job done without tearing and breaking everything it was this type of approach that ended up breaking things. And I'm just wondering if you can just say something about that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, you know, a, a, a couple of things that I'll say. Um, yes, uh, that was radical sit-ins or a strategy. Um, there are, are multiple modes of strategy and tactic that, that can lead to change. Um, I'm, and, you know, the activists within the civil rights movement, whether it's like the radical students or the more you know liberal, um, uh, older factions, were able to shift a particular uh, uh, the edifice of a particular racial regime. They did not tear it down. Uh, their goal wasn't to tear it down, and so in 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 articulating the, necess the necessity of destruction um, and the violence that could come with that, we of course have to be serious about our historical present and the material conditions in which we live in right now. You know, it would be impossible to, to imagine, uh, you know, some sort of armed insurrection by black people against the US military, for example, right now things would have to be done in order for that to happen. Maybe, maybe, and, and who and who knows how to, 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 what the strategy would be to, to like actually be able to mount such a challenge, but it is, so it's, 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 it's not blind to that or the forms of radicalism that you, that you know, it just is uh, clear eyed about the fact that unless the system them as such is gone, not some aspect of it, not the integration of political rights alone. Those are great, those are nice, those are important for material conditions and living on a quotidian basis. But the racial regime during the period that that you that you're noting just shifted to another one. Right? You know, and so that why that is why we have to take seriously what different modes of action would be required in order to not just have the racial regime shift from one to another, but to destroy its possibility altogether. Thank you. Um, we have a number of questions in the chat. Uh, Savannah, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um... So I was like, so I was just thinking like, you know, like in terms of like social media, like our, and like just media in general, like when we lose a member of our community, um, it's usually publicized and then it's like talked about, there's protests and then it dies down and then it happens again. And then people would put something in their bio or like put a hashtag and how do you feel about hashtags and just like generally like media coverage in terms of like black death and just black suffering? 
Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, so there's, I guess there's two ways that I would, would think about that um, or, or res respond to that question. And there are more, so we could actually talk for a long time about this, but I, I won't dwell too long. Uh, hashtags on their own or social media on its own is an ineffective way to address the structures that we've been talking about while it's simultaneously a potentially effective way of mobilizing. Now the hashtag, just putting the hashtag is lazy, but in, in the time of Black Lives Matter, one of the things that I, that I argue in, in, in my book that social media has been really important for political education and for the, cult for the cultivation of you know, a political and cultural and social zeitgeist that translates to how people approach the world in real time, in, you know, on the ground, not just in organizing spaces, but in life. So social, so, you know, if, if one agrees with the idea that political education that can come in different forms is central to the cultivation of movement and action, then social media has become a key site for that political and cultural education, for the cultivation of, let's say, a uh, a style. I mean, like, what, why? Why is Black joy so prevalent? And why? How, how has Black Black Lives Matter and its politics spread globally? It's because of the access that people have in order to not only just understand that there's been continued brutality, but see it in a visceral way. Uh, but then also learn from the ways that other people are responding to it in different places and adopting it. Right. Social media has been key for that. So there's the, there's the, there's the, there's that positive side, but simply putting a hashtag um, and then, you know, uh, some attached to, you know, a, a yet another, um, uh, some uh, black person who, who is prematurely dead alone is, is not enough. And there's, there's often a way that doing so registers displeasure while you can just go about your, your life, continue to go about your life. So in, in that way, it, it can sometimes, or what, what is a black box in response to the XYZ tragedy or whatever, it allows people to feel like they're, you know, um, registering, um, a, a, you know, a moral or ethical response or this, you know, uh, while not doing, while not going any further. So, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, a dual thing there where it can be a bomb on the one hand that doesn't bomb as in B-A-U-M, where, where, you know, it lulls people out of action while simultaneously providing, um, you know, important communicative resources and, and pedago pedagogical tools, whether it's just in the spread of something like anti-Blackness in discourse and where we think about that as a framing. Um, but also in, in, in methods. I hope that addresses the question, at least partially. Um, Jack, Abram Steyer, would you be able to ask your question aloud? Well, I can, I can read it if not. Um, Dr. Harris, do you believe in the uniting of different racial groups with contrasting ideals, a la the Rainbow Coalition, to promote the importance of cl class consciousness above all else? Uh, uh, I believe that coalitions, I mean, this, this is a, a political and strategic question, right? So um, um, uh, uh, I believe that coalition is, will be, Fun, is fundamental. Uh, the construction of that coalition, of course, is, is, is key. And I'm not a supporter of the position that, that, that class is, uh, that everything else should be subordinated underneath class. But I do think, you know, if we're talking about method, I, I, I would adopt you know, more of kind of a, a, a mass line coalitional approach where, where the, uh, where the, where there is a specific attention to 
um, through a class lens, those who, you know, uh, are, are of, of lesser means to galvanize mass support, in other words. Um, but I tend to think that, that Blackness as a marker of difference um, is just as central to, if not, if, if not uh, 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 in some ways, no, I'll just say just as central to the way we need to think about coalition building. And so, whereas a, a coalition, a rainbow-like coalition building around class could allow for white leadership to take hold in such, uh, in such a formation, I, I believe that, again, thinking strategically that our movements need to be black and brown led and that in being black and brown led, it should also be focused on mass mobilization in the class sense, but the class can't be superordinate to, 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 to race or other categories. Uh, Juliet Litwin has a question. For John Jay to be a leader in the abolitionist movement, as stated in the beginning of the call, how could we continue to offer police studies? If this institution were to truly teach the entire historical context of policing in this country and in this city, what, types, what type of people would still aspire to be a part of that system? Mm. Well, I, I don't want to get into the institutional weeds of, your, of, of like John Jay and its imperatives, but I was thinking about this question, not like the contours of the question that was just asked in delivering this, this talk in the first place, you know, um, and, you know, if I were to like reframe what, what, what is, what is an abolition police studies look like or something like that. Um, uh, and, the invitation, I think, is to begin the necessary work of, re of, of what would replace the structures of policing in an abolitionist future and to build, you know, uh, classes that, or, you know, uh, curriculum that simultaneously makes clear why the end of policing and prisons and the carceral state is a necessity, but also to move towards the creative work of being like, okay, so what, what is necessary or what, what, what could we replace it with? How do we engage communities in that conversation? I mean, there's an opportunity for John, for, for any institution that is concerned with criminal justice to be a leader in this space of engaging with communities about questions of safety uh, and to reimagine the possibilities and be, as I was mentioning before, excited about, you know, the kind of opportunity one could be when they say, hey, I no longer want to be someone in uniform with a with a with pepper spray and with a gun and with a um, whatever you call that thing that people hit people with or that police hit people with. Yeah, yeah, but bat baton. It's like it, but imagine themselves um, as playing, you know, a different role um that would replace that one and what what, what and, be, and to be excited about being able to, to serve communities under that umbrella as opposed to the other one so you, these are all questions of imagination and conversation and most importantly community engagement um and i think that institutions that as i mentioned are concerned in criminal justice with criminal justice as it is can and in fact have a responsibility to do or engage that like creative imaginative work in dialogue with communities. It's a roundabout way to answer the question, probably not exactly answering the question, but. Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot more to that question too, especially considering the ways we think about class mobility and being in law enforcement as, as a narrative that says that's a secure way of doing it, right? And so there is a, an element of that too, where, as you said, if everything's changing, it's different. If we're dealing with criminal justice as is, um, I mean, I think a lot of our students think about the history of John Jay in the context of um, the critiques you're giving. So I really, I'm glad that students are, are asking these lines of questions. Um, Natasha is in the library, so I'm going to read Natasha's question. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna read it slightly differently. 
since the white folks have historically used hegemonic violence to create this order, what would be an effective way to cancel those forms of domination in today's era? With the tools we have currently, okay, with the tools we have, okay. So what, uh, um, what, what how, how to counteract hegemonic violence wielded on by stru white structures and like that's the, yeah. Natasha, is that correct? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Yeah, well, you, you know, I mean, I, I think it goes back to um, something that I was mentioning earlier, uh, which is that um, holding on to a larger vision and then being uh, understanding, get, doing an analysis of, of where you actually are. And so, you know, we can't simply, um, this is why I brought up the military before. It was like, it's not a matter of simply thinking weapons in that register. I think, uh, you know, like edu 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 education or the, the, the cultures that we create through our practices uh, are, are in just as important to these seemingly immovable institutions. And so I think that what is actually actionable right now um, for, for anybody is to, to shift, um, is to shift the way people think on the one hand and mobilize around material needs on the other in order to create the conditions through which we might be able to actually attack violent structures. Right? So, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one like, okay, that's here and we just overthrow it. We have to create the conditions by which there is support to do so um, by the largest group of people. And that involves education, but also being attentive to people's material needs. Um, so, so they have the capacity to, or see their interests reflected in that goal. So we have this larger goal, abolition, and we want other people to have that larger goal. So they both have to understand it on the one hand and see their material needs met through it. And until we do that, we'll just be talking about it like we are now. But I think that that is the, the process. And if you study, as again, as I was saying before, if you look at revolutions of the past, it is this coming together of, of these elements that produce the mass force that allows for the dramatic and the radical structural change. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie G, did you have your hand raised? Could you ask the question? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so um, I just wanted to ask, um, like, in your opinion, like the system that we have now in place and the institution that we use, do you feel because of the history of like white supremacy and anti-blackness and all these other historical things that have happened, do you believe that there is like for people that say there is room for like reform and to have reform policies, like to combat the school to prison pipeline, things like that. Do you feel like there is reform to all these things or like, do we just need to destroy these systems in the first hand and build a completely new system? Uh, well, I think I, th I think it's the latter, but 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 we're we're being kind of building off of what I said a second ago. I think we we're, we would be naive not to understand that 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 there are things that we can and should do to help people now, and a lot of those things involve ref reforming and working with what we have, and so the the, the question is not whether or not there should be reform, although some people in, the, in some people on, in, in certain radical circles would, would argue against this. The question is the question is how we're using and thinking about the reform. Is the reform an end in and of itself? Or is the reform a step? What is the goal of the reform, right? If we see the reform as a step that, um, that doesn't, you know, reinforce the structures and the systems as such, but like loosens their grapple, grapple over our lives while simultaneously helping people materially or stopping 
stopping or preventing harm, then, then, then that's positive, especially if we're holding on to the larger goal, right? Then it's just a step. Yeah, you know, the, the, this is, I, I don't want to get into some kind of like stages teleology in a Marxist tradition, but you can, you, can, you can kind of think about it along similar lines insofar as you understand that if, as long as we don't lose sight of the goal, everything that we do is a step in that direction so far as it doesn't reinforce the thing that we're trying to, uh, to take down or um, allow us to get lulled into submission because we got a, a win on some scale. Does, does that address the question? Um, I think we have time for two more questions. So Dr. McKinson, Professor McKinson, and then um, Shoshana, um, your two questions. So go ahead. Okay, um, yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Um, Harris. This was a fantastic talk, and I think you've given us all so much to, to think on. You know, one of the things that I really love is that as you're talking about Black grammar, presenting Black grammar as a kind of subject for us to meditate on, you're also thinking, you know, architecturally in terms of like how you've like um, structured your, your talk, for example, that's a kind of way to think about grammar as well to, you know, in terms of the, 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 the very, you know, words that you've chosen as a way for us to think on black grammar as well to write things like, you know, defacement and what does that mean? Um, if we're really trying to envision abolitionist futures. And one of the things that I keep on coming back to in your talk is this, um, this the, the idea of revival right as a kind of grammar of the body right and you know the choreography of the body is something that i'm deeply interested in and you know it's um, exciting to see how you animate it in your in your work and you know when i think of revival on one hand i think of you know a kind of you know awakening these black choreographies and these you know or these black bodies performing choreographies in excess right you know outside of the bones of white logic or white sense right the shouting and the screaming and the, and and whatnot um, um that kind of defies a kind a, a respectability politics as as well um but when you know when i think of revival too as you know a caribbeanist scholar I also think of revivalism and these you know afro diasporic religious practices which you know um of course you know um become animated um, excess as well but they're also rooted in a kind of hybridization too, right? And there's a kind of synchronism that's inherent in revivalism, you know, in places like, you know, Jamaica and in, you know, um, in other Afro diasporic practices as well too, where it's not just Africanisms, but it's, you know, African elements, European elements as well. And, you know, that has gotten me thinking too, you know, back to this question of allyship and, you know, um, you know, um, communicate a kind of building collective movements as well to it. it, you know, it brings me back to the very moment of um, 2020 that you brought us into these protests, right? And if we think about protests as um, collective choreography in and of themselves too, right? Um, and the ways in which um, we, um, we saw black bodies being, you know, performing choreography alongside white bodies in the streets all across the United States and the globe as well to so, Thinking about those different things, I'm just wondering if you could, you know, um, say a little bit more about um, the potential for abolitionist allyship, but then also to say something about the kind of intellectual and non-intellectual in the, you know, more utilitarian sense, genealogies of revival and revivalism that you're bringing to um, your articulation and your animation of Black grammar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I think I'll have an easier time with the first part than the second, but I'll try um, both. And, and what, what you know, the, the 2020 uprisings were a good example of what, and, you know, I write about this in, in a couple of different places of, of, of what Hortense Spillers calls critical black culture. Um, and then there, there's an argument that, that Spillers makes about, you know, um, black culture, you know, embodying um, the counterstatement to the violent hegemony of, 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 of Western modernity, but that Black critical culture, Black culture as critique, as negation, is not for Black people alone. So the key actually is, and, and, uh, uh, and I, I would say 
kind of like this is going to come off wrong because I'm not finding the right words. Is this like their allyship isn't even the right term? It is. It is. Uh, it is an indoctrination into Black culture as critical culture. It is to accept that you know um, that that you know Black joy, for example, is a prefiguration of a different world, a world where actually joy could exist and be sustained. And so indoctrination into critical Black culture, into the movement of critical Black culture, is to reject white sin. And in that way, you're, you're not simply being an, an ally, right? You, 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 are, you are ideologically aligned with a political project. An ally is to donate to an organization, right? <laughs> right? Like it's to show up at a march or whatever, you know? An ally will put up the hashtag that we talked about before. Right. No, what we're asking for is, 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 is ideological commitment that revolves sacrifice, that would involve sacrifice, um, uh, that would in, involve, you know, subordinating oneself to the tenets of Black-led class conscious movement. And so, and so to, to this question of allyship and, and the way that, you know, like the, again, the 2020 uprisings being a good example of how the critique of say the Black Lives Matter movement of not just violent policing, but of, you know, the world system as such an anti-Black world, if non-Black people can get behind that critique to, to make it their own, to see the violences in their own lives as, as, as also a part of this system that's fundamentally anti-Black, then they are carriers of Black culture as critical culture, Black culture as critique, Black culture uh, as negation. Um, I've, and so what the other part, I've, now I've lost because I was going, I went on a tangent. So just, just, no, <laughs> just like part of the genealogies of revival and revivalism that you're working with. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so one of the things, well, uh, you, you know, I don't know where revival, why revival struck out to me, stuck out to me uh, when when uh, Dr. Solomon and I were we're like constructing this, um, but but there were there was something important not just in thinking about revival on its own or a particular genealogy of revival, but as 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 always sitting alongside defacement. It was never just defacement; it was defacement and revival. And I think what was what what was central to us was thinking about you know. Black joy, which I consider to be like the political cultural dominant in this current conjuncture, in 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 a lineage of, you know, uh, black is beautiful, uh, in a lineage of the new Negro, in a lineage of of these kind of ways of collective self fashioning, and so I think about this. Uh, I guess the best way I can answer, approach the question is not from thinking about. Uh, in, in, in revivalism as a particular mode, historically situated and ge geographically located, as much as a way of naming mechanisms of collective self-fashioning on the one hand, um, and 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 the production of otherwise worlds while simultaneously confined through spiritual practices through body where 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 we practice freedom and now we have always done so. There's this. Uh, um, Stephanie, I'm forgetting, forgetting her name, um, uh, but it's a wonderful article from some year, a couple of years ago, I, I'm forgetting exactly when, that talked about these, you know, in slavery, the, you know, the uh, kind of like illicit parties um, that, that the enslaved in general, and particularly enslaved women in particular, were able, um, were, uh, attended and um, found its way through um, uh, to, uh, to, to really em embody the way the body is an important site of, of world making and practices of liberation, even when enclosed. Um, so not exactly answering the question, but hopefully adding something to the conversation. Thank you so much. This was that was our last question because I know we have to be good on time. So um, 
I really, really want to thank you very much. Um, Professor Booker, did you also want to say something really quick? No, no, thank you so much. I just wanted to remind us of the time and so we don't lose people and we wanted to thank him again. Okay, thank you so much for coming and, and being our inaugural speaker for this series. And thank you all for joining us. And thanks to my co-organizers, Dr. McKinson, Dr. Booker. This is so wonderful. So yes, thank, thank you. you so much, Dr. Harris. Be on the lookout for the March 16 event. It's coming. You'll see the flyers. Thank you so much for attending. We appreciate you all. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you.